Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Newspeak, the New Culture Forum's current affairs program. My name is Emma Webb and this week I'm joined by senior fellow and historian Rafe Hadelman Koo, writer, journalist and senior fellow Mark Sidwell and the director of the New Culture Forum, Peter Whittle. Last week we spoke to Caroline Fisk about the gender debate and the attempts of of gender critical or feminist activists to fight for same-sex spaces and for same-sex rights against the onslaught from gender ideology activists. And this week we've seen this saga continuing um, after JK Rowling posted on Twitter a photograph of herself with some other activists, um, feminists, um, I believe some of them are also lesbian activists, and they just had a nice lunch together and she posted a, a picture of it on Twitter, some of the other people who were in attendance posted some pictures, and it was just a gathering of like-minded people who care about same-sex spaces and then Rosie Jones who is uh, one of the many people who complained about this but her tweet in particular blew up uh, Rosie Jones is a disabled uh, actress a disabled comedian and she posted saying and I'll, I'll read the tweet out um, she said just had a mad angry cry about the photos of JK Rowling at the turf gathering it's disgusting how members of our community can be so hateful. How are we ever meant to break through barriers and stop discrimination if we're too busy attacking each other? Stop hate. And obviously people picked up on this, pointing out that she was actually um, being quite hateful in calling them TERFs, which has been used um, as a slur. What does that actually mean? Sorry, for people who don't know, I'm a TERF. It means uh, trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Okay. So um, many of the people who uh, who get tar sort of tarred as a TERF are not radical feminists at all. They're just, um, some of them are feminists, some of them are not. Some of them are just concerned about sex-based rights and women's equality in, in, a, in a more broad sense, would probably not describe themselves as being feminist at all um, and what was interesting about this was um, that a number of people pointed out you know, aside from um, the whole discussion around the trans debate how strange it is to, to tweet something like this to say that you saw a picture of a woman having a dinner having a dinner or a lunch with other women and you were so upset that you went away and you had a mad angry cry what, what do you think is going on here well I think it's she's not having an angry cry whatever that is I would have thought <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you say? I mean, it sounds like one of those things that just hasn't happened. But Well, but I mean, it, I think it shows just how poisonous uh, Twitter can be as a mm. medium, of course. It creates this space for uh, performative anger and performative emotions as a way of shutting down debate more than opening it up. And I would recommend to everyone, it's a really excellent uh, essay in, in The Atlantic by Jonathan Haidt, who, of, of course, wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, uh, where he looks at the, the role of social media in creating the sort of hyperactive uh, argument that's going on in so many spheres of, of life, and he's talking about America particularly, but here too, and on this issue as well, and the place that in particular social media plays in that, because of course it, it creates this algorithmic need to be angry and to, to stir up um, emotion in, in a very negative way in order to get shared. And I think, you know, I don't know what the, the answer is, and of course social media has many good things too, but there's the medium itself is just is poisonous and you know, in these areas which are so important that we learn how to talk about and disagree well because we have to find an answer that respects women and respects everyone involved. Social media, which could have maybe have been a way that we could all talk together, has become this place where we just gain likes by being angry and, and, and get heat instead of light. It's very sad. I mean, this, is, yeah, I mean, this is just the latest of the whole series of inane and hysterical tweets that Rosie Jones puts out on a regular basis. And I have no idea why anybody cares what this woman thinks. I think she's probably the least funny comedian from a very large pool of unfunny comedians we have at the moment. Uh, yet she has a very large following on Twitter, despite her lack of talent. And um, she's in, she is one of these social media influencers. And one of my great concerns is that the number of people who are influencers in social media, be it Instagram or, or Twitter, who have almost no expertise or knowledge on the subjects on which they're opining mm -hmm. and yet they bring with them the uh, people who are even more ignorant than they are and it seems as if it's the blind leading the blind through so much of this. Now one of those people who was sitting at this very pleasant dinner was a, a bunch of middle-aged ladies who were simply having ladies who lunch as you know the sort of thing that I saw when I when I when I saw it. It included Joanna Cherry the Scottish separatist um, FNP a member of parliament who was uh, kicked out of the um, the party for her views on, on, on this issue. Now 
Joanna Cherry and J.K. Rowling are not two women with whom I would normally sympathise, but I actually found myself empathising with her for the amount of vitriol and hate mm -hmm. and the arguments being put forward that because these are powerful women, they can't possibly be recipients of hate in the same way that it's impossible for a black person to be racist towards a white person. It's that same sort of mentality. And Kathleen Stock, I think, was another another person who was there. And Julie and she, Bendor. And, and, and interestingly, for the same reason, that Kathleen Stock, she's a professor who was, um, I believe it was Sussex University, Mm. She ended up resigning because she'd been We've had harassed her on the show. so much mm. by mm. protests and um, low-level bullying, I guess you would say, for having gender-critical views just because they didn't like the subject of her research. And she was one of the people who, who was at this, this lunch as well. And, and it, again, like you, you say, you know, Rosie Jones is saying stop hate, but she doesn't seem to be particularly concerned when people are being hateful towards people who hold uh, views that are, oppose her views. And Rosie Duffield as well was there, the Labour mm. MP, who faced similar uh, back backlash. But don't, don't you find that most of the people who talk about hate this goes right back to Brexit. I remember during Brexit, Brexit's about hate. Uh, I think Sadiq Khan once said that in one of the hustings about Bre Brexit. You know, they usually are the most sort of hateful people. Quite, I mean, you know, like the be kind thing and, the, and all of this and stop hate. You know, they are the ones who actually uh, stir more hatred up. To be cynical, do you think they just use it to shut down any discussion? Yes, I don't think, for example, as I said earlier, I don't think that people are mortified and crying and really genuinely upset. I mean, you know, people say, I'm offended by that, I find that offensive. Almost never do they actually find it offensive, right? This has been going on for years now. It's just a way of creating a climate whereby people don't say anything. Although, I mean, we'll move on to this later when we talk about Extinction Rebellion, but uh, I don't know if you saw the video of one of the uh, Just Oil, Just Stop Oil activists, not Just Oil, Just Stop Oil activists who uh, chained herself to some building and she was, she said she was 23. She, with the Greta effect and everything, she looked much, much younger and sounded much younger. And she really did seem hysterical. There've been multiple videos over the last couple of days of these, um, of these activists who are in their 20s and they seem like hysterical toddlers. They seem deranged. It seems as if there is something very, very psychologically wrong there. So I don't know whether I, I do doubt that she had a mad, angry cry, as she put it, because having a mad, angry cry seems to be something that that sort of, sort of um, I don't want to say generation because I don't think it's universal to everyone, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if as you were saying, you know, the coddling of the American mind. These are people who have been so coddled and had their feelings so protected that I can imagine that seeing a photograph of someone like J.K. Rowling, whose books she probably would have read as a child, who she would have looked up to, who she now probably genuinely believes is this hate-filled, bile-spewing, evil, demonic figure. She's become sort of Voldemort herself. Well, this is what Jonathan Haidt says, that children have grown up since the 1990s, never being in the presence of another child without another adult present. Mm -hmm. So their entire lives has been without confrontation. They've never been exposed to contrary views. They're always told that everybody's a winner, nobody's a loser. And they've, they've never had an opportunity to even have a, a scrap in the playground or have a snowball thrown at them any longer. They're always uh, in, in, in school, in, in presence of, uh, of, of teachers. At home, the children aren't allowed to go out after dark. In the old days, I'm sure we all bicycled around after dark. And so they are, they are completely shocked when they are faced with contrarian views. And if you look at the responses to that Rosie Jones tweet, so many people are accusing Joanna Cherry from the SNP and J.K. Rowling of being from the alt-right. I mean, the absurdity of that. There's no nuance. Mm -hmm. and I think that whether it's Extinction Rebellion or BLM or the trans lobby, they've become radicalized just the same way that you'd expect in the old days from religious extremists and they've lost any inability to see the, the, the reality of, of course uh, these people are very sympathetic to, the, to, to trans people no one would ever assume these people have any malice towards trans people they're merely standing up for, for, for women's spaces and this, and this inability to see anything other than purely black and white mm -hmm. I think is very disturbing yeah and you know again uh, the Jonathan Heights research and, and, and in that article and elsewhere if you look at the evidence of what's happened to young people's mental health, it really is really is terrifying. There's uh, just shooting up in terms of anxiety and depression. And yes, as, as Rafe says, part of that is to do with them not being able to resolve disputes among themselves, always sort of referring to authorities. They're not playing alone. But it's also, I think, to do with being exposed constantly to these these phones. I mean, you know, I'm still 
had a, a youth before the phone thing came out. But I mean, growing up with, with that generation where you were on the stream all the time, I think that's been terribly bad for people. Do you think that that oversensitivity, or maybe we could call it like emotionalism or something, that that, that emotionalism is affecting people's ability to to, to, to have self-awareness. So in this tweet, she in, at the beginning of the tweet, she, she, she uses the, the slur t turf, and then she goes on to say that we're too busy attacking each other. I don't think that ne she's necessarily aware of the cognitive dissonance within just a few sentences there. And do you think that that's because people have become so, uh, and as, as you see with a lot of the activists, particularly I was saying, you know, Extinction Rebellion, a lot of these young activists are so driven by this almost tribal, um, uh, psychologically one-dimensional um, emotion mm -hmm. to, to just, you know, tar those people that they don't agree with, to protect their own oversensitive um, feelings. Do you, do, is that what's going on here? What is, what it, why, why is it that she could tweet this and not have the self-awareness to realise that she was doing exactly what she was Well, that's the story out? of Twitter though, isn't it? L lack of self-awareness mm. is quite extraordinary. Some of the things people say and, uh, you know, you can go, I mean, there was one by, you know, Keir Starmer this week saying about how the Tories are soft on crime, <laughs> you know, and I mean, of course they are, but Labour, for goodness sake, I mean, you know, for most of us would sort of stop and sort of think, well, actually, maybe I shouldn't say that because considering we had all the grooming gangs and everything, I maybe, maybe I should. No, it's a kind of shamelessness mm -hmm. and lack of self-awareness that Twitter encourages. But I, you see, I don't know about this. When you see these people, for example, with the uh, just say no to oil or whatever it is, um, I just sort of feel that there's this kind of rending of garments going on yeah. like a religious you know there's that old saying when people give up god they will believe in anything mm -hmm. not nothing just anything and there is this feeling i get you know there were a couple of people they were nhs workers on one of the bridges um for this extinction rebellion protest and uh, they were clutching at each other as though like the, the world was ending mm -hmm. you know and you sort of thought Give me a break. You don't for a moment think it's ending. Not mm -hmm. really. This is somehow, this is about showing something else. Yeah. I don't think it's sincere. Most of the time, I think mm -hmm. it's just not sincere. Did you, know? you see the, um, the another video that was doing the rounds of, uh, of a, a young woman confronting Keir Starmer? I think she was a journalist, but she, she was saying that she's also a climate activist and she was saying she's a young person. Lost her hair. And she, exactly. Yeah, she yeah. said she, that she was so stressed about this. That she's that she's losing her hair, bout of anxiety. Well, welcome to the chaos. club, baby. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but but what was interesting was that you know she had an opportunity to confront a senior political figure. She's standing face to face with mm. Keir Starmer. He actually tries to respond to her at one point, and she pr practically arrogantly says, "No, no, no. You let me finish speaking." And uh, when he's very politely just beginning to respond to her point, but then she goes on to explain how she's losing her hair and all of this stuff, and she's confronting him with, um, again, her f her feelings. She's she's trying to persuade him politically by appealing to emotion and anxiety and mm -hmm. mental health and all of these things, rather than making an argument or appealing to him through reason or rationality. Um, and that I I I found that really disturbing. I was surprised by how few people online seem well, to find. I, it I think it's very common. I think this has become you know a, a trope now because. Mm -hmm we don't quite know how to respond to that emotional argument. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think it's very worrying. It also happened, for example, when uh, in the early days of the Ukraine, Ukraine crisis, there was uh, someone who, who uh, sort of a female reporter or something who cried to Boris and was saying, you have to intervene, you have to have a no-fly zone because all these terrible things that are happening. It was a very emotional appeal. And, and Boris, to his credit, you know, said, well, you know, there are reasons why we can't do that. But it is increasingly hard, I think, for people to know what to say in the face of that. And it's very important that we hold on to our ability to think critically and well in these cases. But that, that argument of, of tears and of mad, angry cries or whatever is increasingly, and, and Greta, again, is, is another form of that. It's, well, it's enormously is, unhealthy, but, but it is becoming a very powerful argument, right? And maybe people need to work harder on working out a good response to that. Well, no, because you're responding to children. This is the problem. This is what I think is at the basis of it. The, the, the basically, it's the infantilization of our culture. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a simple. 
a, a, you know, an adult isn't going to sort of stand there and try to rationalise with a child that's having a tantrum, right? That's why you feel impotent about it. Mm. And it's exactly the same here. It's the infantilization. It's the incredible narcissism. You are at the centre of the universe. The you know, I'll scream and scream and scream like Elizabeth Bott or whatever, um, and that I get my way. And um, I find it that is that's an over overall thing. Politics, not politics. It's an overall thing that happens to, dare I say, it, a culture which is in decline. Mm -hmm. you know? Do you think it's anti enlightenment? Do you think it's a kind of counter enlightenment? Mo not movement, but, but I don't think it's anything as conscious as that. I think it's a whole bit what we're all saying. Um, when you say uh, the the kids have not really been um, ever given a kind of uh, opposing view, they're not used. To it. I think that's true. But I would most of this what we're talking about. Um, I would say is on the whole middle class, for example. Uh, I, I have no evidence for saying that, but I, my suspect it is. And that's because middle class parents now, hyper neurotic, right, who basically treat their children like these great little creators who cannot be thwarted in any way. And if they're thwarted, it's never their fault. The idea they could be thick doesn't even enter their heads. There's got to be a reason, though, why people are raising their children in this way. There's got to be well, an intellectual reason yeah. why well, that, is that, that they, they Well, it's actually, a lack of structure. But it's it's when all the structure is done but away But if you with. think about, uh, you know, I mean, in, in my book, The Long March, I talk a, a lot about um, the, the Frankfurt School and Marcuse and people like that. And what you see in that in that movement is, is a sort of very conscious attempt to build an intellectual case against the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And against the Enlightenment, what, what Marcuse in, raises up in sort of one-dimensional man, appealing to the counterculture of the 60s, is this idea of expressive individualism, is that the only way to escape from Western civilization and rationalism, which is effectively for them Nazism by another form, is to go inside yourself and uh, sort of tune out and, and focus on your emotions and expressing those honestly. That's a sort of form of authenticity. It's mm -hmm. the only thing you can hold on to. And, and I think, you know, that book was a massive bestseller. It went quite deep in the culture. And uh, some of these forms arguably do go to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we need to find ways back to something healthier. And it's also important to note that this is a, a product of economic prosperity, because as prosperity has gone up in the West, the number of children per, per family has declined. Mm -hmm. So whereas in the past you could expect to have six, seven or eight children, and you wouldn't care too much if one of them got knocked off or mm -hmm. died in, with infant mortality, now when you only have one or two children, they become venerated. Mm -hmm. They are precious commodities in a way that our parents and grandparents never experienced. And so they are put onto a pedestal. And you see that in force, for example, in Scotland, talking about lowering the voting age. I'd, I'd quite like to see it raised to 21, actually, rather than 18. Yeah, it's and I, 16, and I, is it? Yes, and I say that because I, I thought I really knew my politics when I was 16 or 17 or 18, and I knew more than most people did. And now I realise how wrong I was on so many other issues. And I think if, if, if you're making decisions on independence or Brexit or whatever, you need to have a much more f fully formed view. But this is actually, whether conscious or subconscious, I agree, this is an anti-enlightenment uh, movement. And it is the triumph of feeling over fact. It stems from the, the, the same root as having um, my truth as opposed to truth, from the same root as decolonizing the curriculum, which mm -hmm. says that, oh no, there's the, uh, truth is not objective. There are many different versions. Um, so yes, I think it's all very worrying. Yes, there was a, actually, while we're on the subject of Twitter and clips, there was a great one, actually, which I did repost, um, which was of a, a young black guy having a go at Ben Shapiro oh, at a yeah. conference. And this young guy, <laughs> yes, this, this guy seemed to be under the impression that the idea of masculine and feminine, men and women, was somehow a Western colonial mm -hmm. oppressive view. I, the, what about China and I think Ben Shapiro pointed this out, or Asia or any, any are you really saying to this guy? But this young guy um, had zero kind of awareness obviously of history and had to kind of you know he said oh but you can't you cannot comment on this you are not a you know a biologist or all this kind of stuff yeah. and it was the quite unbelievable as you say lack of self-awareness someone who has been told and basically uh you know sort of as you say venerated for what they are 
you know. That was, that was another example of the ego as well. Because yes. This guy stood up and he started by saying, by listing his achievements, by saying, I am the recipient of this award, and basically listing things that he believed meant that his opinion was unquestionable, that he was more qualified than Ben Shapiro, and therefore everybody just must take his word mm -hmm. for it. And it was a strange sort of um, mixture of that, you know, really narcissistic egotism mixed with that. It is, and you see it all the time amongst arrogant academics who who say I I am more qualified than than this. Like on Twitter, you'll see people will say, um, you know, they'll start a tweet by saying just just dropping in as a, and then they'll put whatever their you know field of yeah, study is that, or isn't whatever. It? Yeah. Um, and it's a way again of, of of shutting down anybody from making a rational argument against you, even though this guy wasn't a biologist, you think he said he was a physicist and a mathematician, and Ben Shapiro's response was fantastic in saying that he should just be stripped of whatever award he'd been given because clearly he wasn't, you know, basically wasn't being rational. Um, but the zeal and the arrogance and the narcissism was really a, vi a vision of an entire generation of people the who The thing were is, can I just, like uh, well, I don't know what you feel because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I'm on Twitter, I go on Twitter and I, and I you know, I put something up usually in the morning and that's it, sometimes at night. Right? But, you know, these clips, we're all talking about clips and these spats and these arguments. And most people are not on Twitter. Does this skew our way of looking at things? Or, do, I mean, do you think that basically the effect of these arguments is far less than we think it is? If you were not on Twitter, you wouldn't know about this spat with J.K. Rowling. If you're not on Twitter, you wouldn't know about our young man with Ben Shapiro. I mean, I watch them. I don't know about you, but in the morning, it, it really gets... Uh, I've, that's it. I'm angry for the day <laughs> or for the morning. Well, this, is, this is what I say about Twitter being terribly bad for the mental health, you so see. And that basically, has, that you should has, come off it, though. But, but also the most powerful and influential people in the world, well, apart from Donald Trump, of course, are, are, are on there. <laughs> and they're on there for a reason, because you can, you can affect the narrative, because uh, it's the passing of information among, among you know, uh, very smart people and interesting people. Twitter is an extraordinary thing, but it's, it's also kind of poisonous as well. I try and... Um, I'm, I'm probably quite disappointing on Twitter because I really try to use it in a sort of read-only way for the most part. But even yeah. then, it's it's. Do maddening. you think Elon Musk is going to make any difference to this? Well, uh, he was going to have a seat on the board of, of Twitter, and now he's declined to have to have that seat, and so it doesn't really seem that he'll have any sort of ability to directly open influence. Him up to more of the company. But yes, exactly. So yeah, the, in the future, perhaps there's an opportunity there. Mm. And I think there's an interesting thing there about. Who has the power now to sort of stand up against these various sort of monolithic situations? J.K. Rowling, Elon Musk, you either have, well, in both cases, you have enormous amounts of money and a certain amount of uncancelability as a result of that. Uh, and then they're, they're having the courage to stand forward, but, but how few people are in that position. But it's, it's, an, it's an odd thing about where we are, the sort of, I don't know, almost sort of neo-feudal situation where you can have a few, the equivalent of the old barons or something who can uh, challenge exactly. the status quo. <laughs> I think, I think though, I mean, to go back to your question, that we know that the majority, and as with the, the whole gender critical debate, we know the majority of people, not just around in the country, but around the world, believe in biological sex. Um, we know that the majority of people have common sense and are rational and that these particularly hysterical, usually young, not always young individuals. There was a very a great example at the debate with Michaela Peterson in Oxford of, a, of an older woman who was definitely equally as hysterical. Um, that we know that these people are anomalous, but that, that it is still a growing and worrying phenomenon. And I think Twitter is interesting because and I, uh, one of the reasons why I think it's valuable, not just Twitter, but also YouTube as well, and, and anybody who's got the sort of courage to, to be on TikTok and not worrying about you know, Chinese spyware or anything like that, um, that a lot of these platforms allow you f to have a window in, particularly to the US, to a lot of the stuff that's going on there and to understand the zeitgeist and to see which way the winds are blowing in public conversation. So on. in that sense, Twitter can be a really 
useful almost diagnostic tool in seeing what's going on in discussions but by the, but by the same politics. token it is through twitter and social media that these influences mm -hmm. bleed into our culture from america yeah. so had it not been for twitter and facebook i don't think blm and Chicken george and floyd <laughs> would have become quite so prominent in this country and unfortunately social media is a great conduit from which it seems the very worst aspects of american or global culture comes in and the uh, the, the best ones are filtered out filtered out somehow whether it's by algorithm or, or what it doesn't seem to, to come in i mean the, the big problem with twitter of course is that is the fact that it's yes it's skewed I don't, I don't think twitter has ever accurately reported any recent election because of course twitter followers are not representative of the, of the broader population but the influencers and the people who are the policy makers and the agenda setters are on there and they are influenced by what they think is the zeitgeist it's not the zeitgeist but when they are setting the agenda look at the labor party for example look at elements of the tory party they're actually making policy decisions based upon what they believe is the public mm -hmm. will but it's not moving on to something that you already mentioned Rafe, decolon decolonization um, there was a story this week in the Telegraph that Durham University has decided uh, to decolonize mathematics and uh, they've said that they were urging their staff to uh, make maths quote more inclusive and to ensure that maths was quote uh, or sorry could uh, be used to aid attempts to secure equality as if that was the purpose of mathematics um, and this guide that has been published says that and this is another quote decolonizing the mathematical mathematical curriculum means considering the cultural origins of mathematical concepts focuses and notation we most we most commonly use um, and there is it set off this whole discussion about this fi new field of research called ethnomathematics which basically believes that maths is not a universal language it's it's the two plus two equals five um, so what what do you think about that why is this you know we, we started seeing this with statues and we we said ourselves at the time this was going to bleed out into other things into other areas of culture into museums into buildings and so on why is this this particular issue of decolonization why is it not going away because I I would say that it's it's treated in the mainstream media, particularly by the, the, what you might call the conservative mainstream media, such as it is, as a kind of fad or as a kind as nonsense, you know, sooner or later we're going to come to our senses. I don't think it is that. The, the maths story you mentioned there in Durham, which was once considered to be quite a conservative kind of university, um, this is about eating away at the very foundations of our culture. I mean, the humanities, Roger Scruton, your great hero, Roger Scruton there, mm. said that basically the humanities were pretty much lost, he thought. So if, if you take that as given, then now they are going through the areas of what you might call hard fact. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, humanities were always going to fall first because it's about perception and, 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 and that's so forth. But you're talking about science now and maths, hard facts. And uh, basically, if you can discredit that, then you have basically, you are like a Despoch beetle going through, if that's what they do, the foundations. That's what we're seeing. It's happening in front of our very eyes. Exactly. It's happening in front of our very eyes. And, and we, I feel that people who could help, could actually stand up, don't quite understand yeah. this i mean i think one of the reasons that it's happening which is always worth thinking about because i think sometimes we get too caught up in the you know the specific cases and we forget about this there is a a regulatory legislative structure underneath it that drives this in some ways in that you have things like the equality act and so forth that are set up which means that large institutions feel well not even feel but but are duty bound to do what they can to promote uh, equality and as the, the, the sort of culture changes around how that needs to be done and that they sense that how they need to do it in order to, to be on the same level as other institutions. They're kind of forced by their position to, to adopt the latest fads f for reasons that are really to do with a, with a whole sort of system of laws and rules that are, that are there around them. So it's, it's not just randomly happening, it's happening as well because of this sort of underpinning system. But I, but I think there's two things about this maths thing. I mean, for one, it is of course 
if we think about the history and the origin of maths, it's, it's in, entirely reasonable to, to acknowledge uh, where things come from. I mean, the, the Greeks were always very open about uh, their, their debt to the Babylonians and their debt to the Persians, the Egyptians, and so forth. And of course, in, in the Middle Ages, you get things like Fibonacci uh, being educated on the North African coast and bringing back Arabic numerals, which of course we, mm -hmm. we'll know as Arabic numerals, although it's slightly unfair to the Indians, but that's another story. <laughs> You know, in that sense, of course, of course, it's very important. But the idea of moving from that, which is not really to do with how we teach maths anyway, because maths is about actually learning how to do the calculations, and changing, as, as Peter says, the, whether we can really trust calculations, that's terrifying. And of course, you say two plus two equals five. Mm -hmm. That's in 1984, you know, as sort of the ultimate thing, is that the big brother can tell you that two plus two equals five actually because it comes from a specific uh, thing in, in Stalinist propaganda. It was about the lies about uh, the, the successes of, of, of Soviet production. And so, you know, or, or well, saying, well, you know, they can make you believe any, anything about the numbers of what's really going on. But it was literally taken up on Twitter again. It was this last year, there was a huge spat about two plus two equals five, where everyone was piling in to explain why it wasn't four, and that was just a sort of an ethnocentric way of thinking about it. And, th and that is very, very worrying. I agree with Peter. Well, there, well there's actually, yes, sorry, but there's all, the, I mean, there are those on the extreme elements of this debate who have actually said that the very concept in mathematics of right and a wrong answer yeah. is, the promotion of white is the promotion of white supremacy. And it is quite remarkable, of course, anybody who walks into a mathematics department in any campus uh, in this country will be amazed at the disproportionate number of Indians and Chinese who were there. And if you go to China and you know some of the best mathematicians, the people ru ruling California's big tech industries are mm -hmm. invariably from India. How come none of this was ever discussed in those countries where, of course, in India, the anti-imperialist um, you know, bandwagon is very strong and yet mathematics was never uh, raised in these countries. And I would have hoped, of all things, mathematics, you know, really is universal, by which I mean it goes from DNA up to the cosmos, you know, entire solar system and our entire universe that we know is based upon mathematics. And to see it reduced to the pettiness of the culture wars, I just think it is, is such a shame. But the thing is, is that <clears throat> I, I think, you know, without wishing to be repetitive, you know, the, I, I so firmly believe this, that it doesn't matter in a way whether it's math or whether it's biology or whatever. This is an entire attack on Western and therefore white civilization. That's what it is. It's a complete attack on it. And if, you know, it's to undermine every reason, every piece of rationale, you know, and it's been remarkably successful, you know, and I think that somehow or other, you know, again, I, uh, I, I said before, the, the idea that somehow people in these institutions are sort of just going with a, a fashion, because they're the ones who should be protecting all of these things, of course, um, I don't even think that's the case. I think that they are the actual innovators often and they are the movers of it. Uh, university authorities, people like this, far more than academics actually. Often the administrators, it's true. Certainly yeah. in America, I don't know about here, but in uh, America the administrators are much worse than the, the academics who of course have some in intellectual integrity. Exactly, and also it's the same with corporations. It's in the HR departments that these kind of things are now. Who would have thought that? You know, who would have thought something as boring as personnel, hmm. as the we used to call it, <laughs> when I was going out, would actually be the engines of all of so much of this, which they are. Um, you know, and I think that we have got to wise up on this. You know, we've got to take this seriously. But as I say, I mean, the reason I, I raise the, the issue about laws and, and rules, Peter, is, is I do think people don't think about what's under the surface that helps to drive it. And these are ways that maybe they can be attacked because culture is it's very intangible. It's difficult to know what to do about that. But when there are rules and laws, they can be changed. And to bring it back to HR, which you were just talking about, as a guy in America, Richard Hanani is very, very interesting on this. Civil rights law is the reason we have HR departments. They are a direct outgrowth of that law. Right. And unless, you, unless people think about you know, what, what was going on and, what, what are the laws that are helping to drive these, these emergent um, sort of administrative but don't situations? Don't the laws come out of a kind of cultural uh, incentive? They sort of come out of that. They, would, they don't just arrive and say, oh, let's have this in the law. But, but no they, one created the law in order to have this happen, I think. They created the law really? to try. They created oh, the law so sure in, in, in order to, to create greater equality at pace. 
but they didn't necessarily think about the giant bureaucracies that were going to turn up or the more poisonous forms they were going to take, I'd say. I don't know whether I agree with you on that. I think a, a lot of it actually, you know, well, the Tories just go along with everything, yes. basically. So yes. it's, fair enough. It's but I think a lot tragic of it, flaw. basically a lot of it was born of a general kind of uh, instinct against the status quo. Right? Mm. And basically that any minority must be preferred over the majority. Right? So that will be reflected in your law. But that, contrari that contrarian streak isn't just, you know, limited to that. I think I mean, what, one of the things this has been criticised for is anti-intellectualism and everything we've been talking about is an anti-enlightenment values, anti-rationalism, anti-reason, that this, it, that it's this corrosive, destructive instinct that it goes beyond just that, that there's, I mean, perhaps yeah, you're right, it is, it is intangible, but do you think that, that this is, uh, particularly within educational institutions, if, if you agree with people like Doug Stokes, and I think he was one of the people who, he certainly criticised it, I think he was one of the people who said that it's anti-intellectualism, what are the implications for those institutions if they have been taken over by an anti-intellectual culture? Well, there's going to be a dilution of the quality both of the teaching and of the academic population, especially when you have um, um, equality of outcome in application processes. And we've seen in Harvard University, for example, clear evidence of racism whereby Harvard University are rejecting applications from, say, Chinese students in favor of lower achieving students from, say, black or and other backgrounds, simply in order to achieve quotas. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you are theoretically turning down potential Nobel Prize winners in the interest of equality. And you see, in, in America, I think, has, has got the solution here by establishing private educational colleges, you know, be, be it from Hill, Hillsdale and, 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 um, and others, uh, which are basically offering, primarily in the classics now, but I think there's room now, if this is going to seep into the sciences, to establish new private institutions that can offer the teaching that um, students want and need them from which society as a whole will benefit. But the great irony here, I think, is that um, the decolonization movement is inherently racist by telling minorities, you actually aren't, aren't able to grasp mathematics unless we introduce non-white mathematicians into, into, into the syllabus. Going back actually to um, a, another subject that's been in the news this week that it relates to this has been the sort of it was the sort of big bang moment of the decolonization movement in this country and that was the toppling of Colston um, and recently we we saw that the, the the four that were responsible for toppling the statue had been acquitted and now this week it's been announced that uh, the Attorney General is seeking to um, basically send this case to the Court of Appeal. It's been sent to the Court of Appeal um, and the Atten Attorney General is seeking to get clarification around the law because uh, frankly just is uncertain now as to what a person is able to get away with and what sorts of defences they can put up because the, one of the arguments that they made, um, going back to what you were saying Rafe, is that um, they said that the existence of the statue itself was a hate crime and therefore they had a duty to remove the statue. And so the Attorney General is now seeking clarification of what the law actually is and we're seeing a lot of protests this week so it's possible that the implications of this are going to be quite broad. Um, how, how do you see this panning out um, with this going to the Court of Appeal? In what way do you think that, you know, they're obviously going to have to provide some kind of clarification. Which way do you think it's going to fall? If it's possible to predict. Peter? Oh, uh, <laughs> you're <laughs> picking you, on me you, and I'm you, you nursing a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't, I mean, it, I think it was an outrageous judgment, actually. Um, obviously, we were very active around that time with Save Our Statues. And uh, you know, this was, whatever you think of Colson, the, uh, the man in the statues, immaterial. It was just pure, unadulterated criminal damage. Mm -hmm. And uh, was sort of, not exactly aided and abetted by the police, but allowed to happen by police inactivity. Um, I would obviously, I don't know which way it will go, but you see in a way, supposing it came back, if you like, in our favor, in the sense that it was, seen as criminal damage and, and there was very uh, clarification was like a form of judicial review I guess I suppose something like that um, in a way the damage is done mm -hmm. uh, people don't follow these cases in out in out they don't right 
Um, so supposing it were to come back saying actually that was the judgment was poor, incorrect, and it should you know, then great. But the damage is done. I think mm -hmm. that there are people now who really do think, when, once they saw those idiots coming out onto the steps and waving and being clapped and applauded, um, they really think that actually they have a moral right. You know, this idea that y you have a moral right to oppose an immoral law. Mm. What is that? That's utterly subjective. But, isn't but it? there is some reason for optimism here because um, there's quite a lot of um, reason to, to believe that the judge who made the decision was uh, gave the wrong direction to the jury. There was a Supreme Court ruling upon which she based her, her decision, which was re in relation to protesters who blocked part of a highway and were charged with obstruction. And the courts there ruled that charging them with obstruction interfered with their rights to protest. But it's been held by a higher court, actually, in another case, that that doesn't give a generic right for you to have the ability to protest and cause criminal damage. Mm -hmm. So there is some opportunity here. But I don't see why we even need to go to the Court of Appeal. Parliament is sovereign, and I don't see why Parliament can't simply pass legislation that says any act of damage to a, in a, in, you have the right to protest but if that causes damage to public art any monument or memorial it's a criminal but, offense but it's surely already a criminal offence, or, or, but I mean, in any case, we know why Parliament isn't going but to was, do that. But if there's outrage. clear direction, yes. then you won't actually have this sort of a situation arising. Yeah. Or, or if, at least, if a, if a precedent has been set, this would be a way to, uh, yeah. to, to draw a line through it. All the institutions, sorry, Mark, no, no. all the institutions to see whether it's Guy's Hospital, yeah. this is all happening from the inside. I mean, whether even with the police, I'm sorry, you know, but do you remember the guy at the Edward Colston incident, the yeah. chief policeman there, more or less giving a wink to the camera, saying we're on your side almost. Yeah. I mean, it was just a point. But even, even, again, another, an, another thing um, in the news this week relating to the Extinction Rebellion uh, protests is that a judge who was issuing some of these protesters a fine, um, I think it was Insulate Britain rather than Extinction Rebellion, but same difference. Um, this judge said, it, I, I believe, I, 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 I think it was whilst he was sentencing them, um, or, or handing out this fine, um, he actually said that he sympathised with them and that he found them inspiring. Um, and it, that that just goes to, you, you, know, you mentioned the police officer and we talk about all of the institutions and so on, but if we have judges who even while stop holding the law and mm. issuing a fine, undermine the law. will undermine it mm. by saying that nevertheless they feel inspired by the protesters Precisely. and that I think he or, or said feel that they they need to say that whether or not they yeah. actually and I feel think it he, or not he went on to say that he that he himself has been making changes in his life or something to do with the you know being more eco-friendly but the point is that the message this sends just as the message that police officer sent and and you know regardless of the ins and outs of the law the message this has been sending in through policing and through the legal system is that there? It, it is a two-tier system. That if you are, if your objectives are the right objectives, then it's okay for you to commit criminal damage, and you can use Weasley words to mount your defence, and you'll be successful in doing that. But this is precisely the point that I was just making. Whilst it's fine for the Attorney General to refer the Coulson issue to the Court of Appeal, it's up to Parliament to make these decisions because we can't trust our judges. I don't think we can't trust the police. And in fact, in terms of Extinction Rebellion. The government did try to put through legislation that would make it a, a crime to have glue or bicycle chains mm -hmm. on, your, on your person when you're going to a protest, or if you did lock yourself onto something, that in itself would be, a, would, be a, would be a crime, and it was blocked in the House of Lords. But there is hope that it will come through in the next Queen's speech, so I'm a bit more hopeful. Mm -hmm. But look, we, we're supposed to have a Conservative government. If they can't do the job on this, then we really are lost. Because yes, I don't really have as much faith in the judiciary as I would have had 10 years do you have more but, but faith in Parliament than the judiciary? <laughs> let's, With let's an ACC say, majority, I would hope so. But <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I mean, we, we know that the party like no. the party is fairly <laughs> hopeless. No, but I, I think we should we should give more credit to... It's Suella Braverman, right, yeah. is doing this. I mean, you know, that it, it, this is a courageous thing to do. It's already over. We know everyone's against her. She has her instincts in the right place. She's spoken about some of these issues in public. She's been violently attacked for mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, there, there is someone who at least does understand some of the concerns and is trying to do something about it. So, you know, as a whole, there are all sorts of problems, but there are still individuals who do good things. And I think we should, we should give her credit for that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, we began by talking about this sort of uh, culture of, of emotions and oversensitivity and irrationalism? 
Do you think that we are, or perhaps maybe you think it's it's a, an overstatement to say that it seems as if, as a, sort of mass psychology is tilting in a direction of lawlessness? I would say that's a very big question, you know, answers on a postcard, you know. I, <laughs> I would just add, actually, to link your two points there, emotionalism and feeling, the behaviour of the people when they pulled down that statue mm -hmm. is all part of what you're talking about. If yeah. you remember, they stamped on it like children. They stamped on it like the level of hatred mm -hmm. that had built up in these people for this inanimate object, you know, hitting it, cheering when it fell in the... You can pull stuff down. I mean, they did during the... Obviously, in the communist era, pull things down. You know, but this was kind of unhinged. It felt like a, it looked like a ritual act. It was it, exactly, and in fact, indeed, around that time, um, just while we're on the subject of this, um, people started going to where George Floyd had been killed, and uh, were having sort of religious ceremonies, like uh, bathing in in waters. I mean, that kind of level of irrationality, mm -hmm. you know. But in answer to your question, I I would say. I don't know what you guys think, but uh, again, I come back to a class issue. I don't think that amongst the majority of, dare I say, ordinary people, I hate that expression, there, there isn't this kind of mass psychosis. I think it's much more of a middle class thing, you know? I think it, it, there, there is a, a strange thing going on with middle class people, not, you know, lawlessness. I don't think it's a working class thing. I don't. I, I worry uh, about what happens when the, the younger, more emotional uh, generation, which, you know, even if it's just middle class people, these are people who move into positions of power and influence, as, as we all know. These are, these are people coming out of the universities, taking these values into important institutions. As they move from being what they are now, which is the sort of the small people at the bottom of the heap who are sort of railing against the institution from the bottom and still being quite influential, move up the power structure and become the people who are running them. I think that suggests things are going to get much worse. And if I really worry, I look at San Francisco. I think San Francisco is a very interesting example of a city which is mm, uh, the wokest of the woke um, in a sort of American cities, but is also proving utterly dysfunctional and is having real issues with, with lawlessness and crime and doesn't know how to handle drug addiction and, and homelessness and questions like that. Um, now, there are, there are perhaps signs of a fight back and we'll see who ends up controlling the city in the future, but uh, yeah, that, that, there are worries there, although further away and more in America than here at the moment, I'd say. Rafe, do you think that um, reality will have, uh, sort of, reality will come in at some point and check this and, and bring people back? Because you were saying, you know, the lawlessness of somewhere like San Francisco, that at some point, you, the, so, so much um, sort of chaos ensues that the, the, the facts of existence and daily life at some point, sure, I mean, people said this around COVID and, and, and you know, all sorts, and they believed that that was going to reset things. But do you think that there's anything that could snap people back to reality? Things are going to get a lot, lot worse before they get, before they start getting better. I think it's a generational thing. Uh, unfortunately, the last two generations haven't given hope that each generation rebels against the previous generation. While there is some hope, I've seen some studies about our youngest generation sometimes being, the, being at more elements of conservatism there than in previous generations. Uh, one can only hope that some sanity breaks through. But as I've said repeatedly on this channel, when you have a, an education system and a teacher training college system where those people who voted conservative are in single digits mm -hmm. and you have children who are raised from the age of five all the way through university to 21 in this overtly leftist Marxist ideology is very difficult to see any way out of this. So speaking of conservatives, to end with some final thoughts, Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson um, getting themselves in trouble this week, Boris being fined over the party gate scandal and Rishi um, basically kicking off a new party gate scandal with um, Rishi Gate. Do you care about this? Is it important? Does it matter? Fishy Rishi. <laughs> um, Do you think so? Do you think that I, he's I, up to I would good, be or? surprised if they resigned, actually. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I'd be surprised if, I don't know, maybe Rishi Sunak sort of thought, you know, to, to hell with this for a game of soldiers. He might have thought that he's wealthy, his family's wealthy, he's successful. 
um, he might sort of think, actually, you know, I don't need this. You, you, that could happen. Um, I wouldn't have thought Boris would resign over it, should he? Um, I suppose that <laughs> we've become used to such a deterioration in public standards that, you know, one is left actually ask, asking that question. You know, once upon a time, I think it would have been absolutely clear if you had misled Parliament and you'd lied even about a small thing. I mean, for me, the one and most important thing about this is not the fact of the party or any of that. And it remains that they didn't, it wasn't just that they were hypo hypocritical, they didn't believe, actually, in what they were doing. That's, I think, the far more dangerous thing. They didn't believe that these measures really worked. They were just doing it, you know. And I think that that, that to me is far worse than, you know, because people are now portraying it very much as, oh, we gave up all this, and yet you went ahead and did this. Mm -hmm. I think that that would just that is appalling. Of course it is, but I I can't help feeling that they actually these people basically put these laws in place and these restrictions whilst actually not thinking that they were really, they had a point actually, that they had, a, they you, had any kind of Do point. you think though that I mean, the Rishi story is, is, is quite different to Partygate in that he's being accused of hypocrisy because he's the chancellor and now he's being questioned over his personal finances. And even though he has himself said that he, he would like an inquiry to take place because he believes that everything is done is above board and it seems that everything is done has been legal and above board, whether you think it might be bad optics that his wife had non-dom status. Um, it's bad are, optics, but they haven't done but, anything wrong. But do you I mean, think that this that all of this is a kind of stories like this in a way are almost like a release valve for the pressure that they're a distraction from all of the more important things that have been going on that that they are creating this the the press are creating this whole hubbub around things that have presumably been leaked for a reason yeah, well i mean sure there, no doubt there are lots of people who hate boris in particular and the tory party in general the fact that it's in power and, and no doubt some of that is is going on here i think it's entirely reasonable that everyone is also utterly furious with them for having had these parties and for you know at least of being not aware that they were having parties which shows a sort of astonishing lack of interest in what the rules were that they were actually imposing yeah. on the country at, at very best but of course mm -hmm. um Rishi Sunak was also fined himself mm -hmm. uh, for, for the party gate. So he was involved in both. It's not just the, yeah. the tax issue. And, and interestingly, Peter, you say, well, maybe he thought about it. Uh, he's released, at least, or friends of Rishi or whatever, that he thought for hours about resigning and then courageously decided to stay since he might <laughs> otherwise have not been able to maybe become prime minister in the future. And I have to say, I, I <laughs> used to quite like him. Rishi and I now loathe him. And I, and I think, really? you I think, I think he should have... Frankly, he should have had to resign after the budget, which was absurd. That was a, a disgustingly career. Oh, this robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, it, no, mm. it's more that he knew perfectly well that the country was going into an incredibly difficult situation. Look at what inflation is like. Look at what mm. is happening with with electricity bills and with all the various tax rises that they are bringing in. Not just the NI rise, but also on the, the income tax bans. He was doing all of that. He was doing all this stupid stuff about oh, we've got to pay off the the debt immediately, which isn't true. And all he was really interested in was the fact that maybe I'm going to be prime minister soon, so I'll set up this budget so it'll be good by the time we get to the point where I'm probably going to be prime minister. Exactly. Yeah, I right, was, right. was loathsome. And, and over this too, you know, he should resign because he's not going to be prime minister now. I couldn't I, agree more. I, 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 I just can't see it. It's, it's really shown how naive he is and how um, Just focused on his narrow interests. The big level politics he is. Just to, just to think that it's fine for your wife to have done non-dom status, even though you, it, it obviously is fine, but just the, the politics of it, he's still wet behind the ears, and I think it just shows what a dearth of talent there is in the Conservative Party, that people are being promoted so so far ahead of their talents, abilities, or all of their experience. But be it, be it that, be it Boris with Partygate, there's all of this just reeks of incompetence, of chaos, of mismanagement, of a lack of any co coherence in policies, and of course, obviously also of dis being disingenuous. This is a Tory party in name only, and uh, it's really hard for me to get motivated or, or inspired or interested in a party which I think has lost its way. Mm. Well, hell, that's a note to end on, <laughs> isn't it? Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you would like to see more of our content, and we wish you a very happy Easter. Thank you, Peter.
Peter, thank you Mark, thank you Ray, Thanks, and we will see you all next time. Hello, if you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member you'll receive a range of benefits including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events including here at our studios, free copies of our books and much much more including of course our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.